Newbegin, and I'm an Emeritus Professor in Italian Studies at the University of Sydney. I'm here to introduce our exhibition, uh, Dante all'altro polo, Dante at the Other Pole, that's been prepared in conjunction with the Department of Italian Studies, the State Library of New South Wales, and rare books and special collections. I'd also like to introduce my co-curator, Julie Price, from Rare Books and Special Collections. We've called the exhibition Dante all'altro polo, Dante at the Other Pole, picking up on Dante's own reference to the stars of the Other Pole, uh, as well as to the journal Altro Polo that was published for many years by the Frederick Bay Foundation for Italian Studies. And we also pick up on the motto of the university, Sede de Menze Adem Mutato, the same mind under different stars. And in recalling all these links, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this Gadigal country and their far more ancient relationship with the stars of the other pole. So Nerida, could you tell me um, something about how you've structured the exhibition and any, any themes that you've followed through? Let's go in and have a look at, at what's inside. The progression around the exhibition is largely chronological, from Dante's life and works through to the transmission of his texts and then his afterlife in fiction and art and cinema mm. and popular culture. Some themes recur, there's Dante in language, Dante in the papacy, Dante in politics and Dante as a presence in Australian cultural life and also Dante as a focus focus of giving to our library. And all of these stories can be explored through the extraordinary holdings of the University Library, uh, brought together through the generosity of donors, the enthusiasm of teachers, and the far-sightedness of librarians. I see in these first cabinets here that, um, that we have Dante's books. What did Dante read and what did he have access to at that time? All of Dante's books were manuscripts. Printed books didn't appear until 1450 or so, 140 years after Dante's death. We do not know what books he owned, but he certainly had access to the libraries of the big convents in France, Santa Croce, Santo Spirito and uh, Santa Maria Novella. In the Convivio he tells us that he spent 30 months attending lectures in those convents and reading their books. And 19th century scholars, people like uh, Edward Moore, have been able to identify his readings from quotations from them in Dante's works. And his readings included the Bible, uh, Nicholas of Lyra's commentary on the Bible, we have here a 15th century manuscript and the commentary on Psalm 113, In Exitu Israele de Egipto. He read Boethius, a work in prose and verse from the 6th century uh, that considers how evil can exist in a world governed by God and how happiness can be attained in the face of fortune. Terribly important work for Dante. And then we have Dante's poets, poets that he read, that he possibly knew by heart. We have Lucan, Ovid, Virgil, Statius, but the most important of these is Virgil. And we'll see Virgil and Dante drawn together, depicted together in illustrations to the first two parts of the Commedia as we move around. 
Further on, in, cases, in case six, we have works of astronomy and theology and the Tesoretto of Brunetto Latini. And we have some manuscripts here. Um, were any of them by Dante himself? Absolutely nothing survives in Dante's own hand. And we have no early manuscripts of Dante in Australia or New Zealand, though there is one in South Africa. We have, though, a wonderful collection of facsimiles, that is, photographic reproductions of early manuscripts with their illustrations and commentaries. They're displayed in the large display cases on this side and the other side here. Some of the manuscripts contain text only, but within a generation of Dante's death, the text required annotations, commentary, to explain to the next generation of readers just what Dante meant by his text. So we have here also a reproduction of a futurist poster that says that the Divine Comedy is a snake pit of footnoters. It's an absolutely wonderful piece of 20th century anti-medievalism by, by Marinetti. One of the people who needed explanation was he who made the great refusal. And in this manuscript here, you can see Pope Celestine V asleep in his bed and Pope Boniface, who will come up again as we go around, whispering through a trumpet into his ear saying, abdicate, abdicate. And an early owner of this 15th century manuscript has crossed out that bit of the story and says, the author is mistaken. So now we're moving to the section of Dante's other works, starting, of, starting with Vita Nuova. Yes. What have we got displayed in front of us here? We've got Dante's so-called minor works and spurious works. The Vita Nuova was censored in the Counter-Reformation because it's references to love, the god of love being a divinity. And it absolutely slipped from sight, but it was rediscovered in the, by the Pre-Raphaelites in England. We can see a wonderfully decorated edition here. We also have an early printed edition from 1531, printed by Melchior Sessa, and in the bottom you can see his printer's mark, a cat with a mouse in its mouth. Dante's authorship of some of the other works is contested. There's a Latin letters, a treatise on earth and water, again in Latin, the Fiore and the Detto d'Amore that weren't even considered as works by Dante when I was a student. They're now accepted by some but not by others. And we also have in the middle of this shelf, the Credo di Dante, which was believed very widely in the Middle Ages to have been by Dante himself and turns out to have been a, a 15th century work. And so was Dante considered a heretic? He certainly was in some quarters. In fact, a public burning of his treatise, the Monarchia, was organised in 1329. In the Monarchia, Dante defended the rights of the Holy Roman Emperor against the papacy, against the claims of the Pope and the hostility of the Guelphs, arguing that the empire is necessary for the happiness of humankind. The Monarchia went on to the index of prohibited books and it remained there until 1881. We'll see later on how it was taken up in other quarters by uh, unification of Italy, uh, by fascism, and how, what it meant in the, the 1920s. Here we seem to have two very important books on the language question. Um, can you tell us why these two are so special? Yes. Here we have, on the top shelf, Pietro Bembo's Prose della Volga Lingua, a treatise on the vernacular dating to 1525, and this is from our own collection. It's a very rare first edition. Uh, and on the next shelf, we have 
an edition lent to us by the State Library of New South Wales, Dante's De Vulgari Eloquentia in an Italian translation, dates to 1527. Now, Cardinal Bembo established himself as the arbiter of Italian language, arbiter of grammar and style. And in his prose, he advocated for Petrarch, not Dante, as the model for poetic language. And as a result of Bimbo's coming down on the side of Petrarch, Dante's prestige began to decline in Italy during the 16th century. Petrarchism established itself throughout Europe and everybody could write a Petrarchan sonnet. Now we're moving on to printed editions of Dante's comedy. Yes. And what particular items would you like to feature? Well, the history of printed editions of Dante's Divina Commedia is very much the history of printing. We saw up in the first cabinet a copy of the Gutenberg printing of the Bible. Dante himself didn't go into print until 1472. The earliest commedia, printed commedia, was printed in Foligno by a German printer and his Italian uh, printing companion. And we're fortunate to have two different facsimiles of the two different states of that printing. The oldest printed Dante in Australia is this 1477 edition on the top shelf, which is in absolutely perfect condition, which seems to suggest either that it was very well looked after, or more probably, it was never read at all. Beautifully bound, beautiful condition, and as you can see, the text is weighted down with commentary. This was printed in Venice by another German printer, Wendelin of Speyer, and our copy was the gift of Sir Charles Nicholson, part of the Nicholson bequest, that has left its mark on so many parts of the university. These early editions are unadorned. When do we start seeing the illustrations in the early volumes? Well, we don't have a copy of the first illustrated edition of Dante, but we have included a reproduction of three pages of it. In 1481, the city of Florence reclaimed Dante by commissioning a commentary from uh, Cristoforo Landino and new illustrations from Sandro Botticelli. The printing process with copper plate engravings is a two-stage process and the printer clearly had great difficulty getting the impagination right, leaving the right amount of space and the illustration seats after Canto 19. What we do have then is uh, reproductions of later Botticelli illustrations for Dante that he did for a manuscript, one of the later Medici. There's no satisfactory big format uh, facsimile of these. Uh, when it comes up, we'll be getting it. <laughs> if we cross over here, we can see the next stage of printing ornamentation. This is our 1484 edition, printed by Ottaviano Scotto in Venice. Scotto was the first printer to use woodcut initials to decorate the text rather than leaving an empty space for an illuminator to come in and decorate the text. And as we know from the editions that we own, very often the space was just left blank. So this was a wonderful innovation by Scotto. The technique of woodcut illustration was developed quite quickly and below we have a facsimile of the 1487 edition from Brescia which is decorated with full page illustrations. Some of them taken from the original Botticelli drawings but they go all the way through and they they become quite independent towards the end. And I noticed that um, a, lot of these, a lot of these books have been in large format. 
Um, however, now we come to some smaller format books. This is the edition printed by Aldo Manuzio in 1502, and it marks an absolute turning point in the history of printing in Italy. Working with our old friend Cardinal Bembo, back from the other side, Manutio printed new unannotated editions of the Commedia, small format editions. First the Greek classics, then the Roman classics in a nice Roman type, and for the Italian classics, Petrarch and Dante and Boccaccio would come later, he had designed and created a new type, Italic type which is the same italic type that we have today. Aldo Manuzio's anchor and dolphin printer's mark are synonymous now with fine printing, the best printing possible. And we have other works in this cabinet. Dante is writing about size and shape and other people are writing about the size and shape of Dante's hill. Now we come to an extraordinary treasure that was only discovered recently and it made international headlines. Would you like to tell us a little bit about this? Yes. Our copy of the 1497 edition of the Commedia leapt into the spotlight in 2017 when librarian Kim Wilson became curious about an inscription and a drawing on the verso of the final leaf of the book. The inscription records the death of the painter Giorgio da Castelfranco, that is the great Giorgione, Venetian painter. The drawing has now been attributed by Giorgione expert Janie Anderson to the painter. Research to confirm this attribution is ongoing, but our display has QR code links to multimedia presentations of the volume. Even without the inscription and the drawing, this is an interesting addition. It's lost its first choir, which contained Landino's Proemio, his introduction, and Marsilio Ficino's Praise of Dante, but the rest is complete. It contains woodcut illustrations, deriving ultimately from the Brescia edition in the previous window. And now I notice there's quite a large chronological leap from the 16th to 18th century. How did Dante's work make a comeback? After Bembo's dismissal of the Commedia as a model for poetry and the church's censure of the Monarchia, Dante slipped into near oblivion in the 16th century, which saw only three editions of his poem. In the 18th century, however, antiquarianism, nationalism, pan-European enlightenment and the Risorgimento all led Italian eruditi to reconsider Dante. New editions of his complete works appeared based on careful transcriptions of the manuscripts, but the Monarchia remained excluded. There were other reasons too. Political and social upheaval in Italy saw Italians like Ugo Foscolo move abroad, and it was Foscolo who introduced Dante to the English Romantics. And another thing happened. The Napoleonic suppression of religious institutions was directly responsible for dismantling monastic libraries, church libraries throughout Italy and books and objets d'art flooded onto the market and many of them found their way into the collections of English people doing the Grand Tour, subsequently into university libraries and American libraries and even Australian libraries abroad. I'll pause here to show some illustrations, two that I want to, to point out. Down the bottom we have Flaxman, John Flaxman, who started his career designing neoclassical reliefs for Josiah Wedgwood's Jasper Ware. And over here on the bottom shelf, the other uber-famous French illustrator, 
and printmaker Gustave Doré, whose engravings graced not only the Divine Comedy, but the Bible, Milton, Rabelais, Shakespeare, Cervantes, Victor Hugo, Tennyson, Ariosto, Edgar Allan Poe, and many, many more. His production was absolutely prodigious, and he absolutely shaped modern illustration to the Commedia. And I noticed you, you sort of skipped over quite a few English translations there. With regret, but I'll go back to one of them. I can't resist pointing out this one. Just moving in close. It is a, a refugee from the private lunatic asylum of G.A. Tucker. This is from the Sydney suburb of Tempe. So Dante is a cure for many conditions of the soul. I think it's absolutely wonderful. It's a lovely addition with illustrations from a lunatic asylum. And now I see we're at the large format folio editions again. Could you talk a little bit more about the Urbino Dante, please? This is one of my absolute favourites. It was made for Federico da Montefeltro, Duke of Urbino, in the 15th century. He didn't like printed books. In fact, according to a, one of his contemporaries, a bookseller, his library had no printed books because he would have been ashamed of them. Sometime before 1478, and after that first printed edition had appeared, Federico realised that he didn't have a proper Dante. So he commissioned one to be copied in the very, from the very best available text and in the most beautiful humanist hand. The illustrations weren't completed until the beginning of the 17th century when the manuscript passed to the Vatican Library. And we now come to United Italy and yet another renewal of interest in Dante as a national hero. How did this come about? Well, in 1865, the newly created Italian state celebrated the centenary, the sixth centenary of Dante's birth, inaugurating a tradition that is still alive today. The proposal to do so came from an Englishman, Henry Clark Barlow. He was one of that vast tribe of Englishmen who found their spiritual home in Italy and dedicated their lives to the study of Dante. In 1858, he became aware that Germany was celebrating the centenary of Schiller and he urged the Italians to do the same for Dante. The Dante centenary led directly to the founding of various Dante societies in Oxford, in Boston and in Germany as well as in Italy. Part of Dante's appeal to erudite Anglicans and Episcopalians lay in his perceived anti-papal stance, so no accusations of popery could be levelled against those who studied him, the clergy and the laity of Oxford and Boston. In Italy, however, old tensions between Dante and the church were not set aside. The church remained aloof from these 1865 celebrations and refused to allow any official honour to a writer who had criticised so many of the clergy. And our last window in this section seems to be devoted to Francesca da Rimini. Yes, and it's a, a very crowded window. Poor Francesca, both cheated and cheating. She's appealed perhaps more than any other sinner in the Commedia to later authors. Here we have a series of plays and play scripts and by famous and forgotten authors. I particularly like the D'Annunzio version, which is a, a lavishly decorated Art Nouveau piece that 
reflect the excesses of the text. The play may be pure poetry, but it's immensely long. It was performed in Rome only once in 1901. It lasted five hours, and many of the speeches were inaudible on account of the noise in the theater. Further performances were prohibited by the censor on moral grounds. We also have a manuscript and a printed edition of a version by an Australian author, Edward Weidler. A curiosity, I fear, rather than a masterpiece. And now we're out in the corridor and looking at works associated with the sixth century of Dante's death in 1921. Um, the covers and titles suggest, first of all, a new aesthetic but also a new interest in Dante as a political author. Yes, the, the celebration in 1921 of the 6th centenary of Dante's death tapped the same vein of nationalistic fervour that would lead to regime change the following year. In Italy and abroad, innumerable special editions uh, were published. There were editions, medals, commemorations, and it drew a line between the horrors of the Great War and enormous optimism for what was to come, a new prosperity that was going to be ushered in by Dante. Dante soon became part of fascism's intellectual showcase. He was put to work in the school curriculum designed by Giovanni Gentile and his Monarchia was taken up again and not least by Ezra Pound whose name has been adopted in the 21st century by the neo-fascist group Casa Pound. Pound has been called the last Ghibelline. He read the Monarchia at least four times and he remained absolutely unwavering in his support for Mussolini, the boss as he called him, a kind of emperor that Dante would have envisaged. Pound sent copies of his cantos to Mussolini and in Canto 41, shown here, he dramatizes the presentation of the canto. And now we have two painters, um, two non-Italians as well, Salvador Dali and Gary Sheed. So I'm not sure how we acquired the Dali images. A limited edition of uh, 100 prints commissioned by the Italian government for the 1965 centenary of Dante's birth. Even though Dali himself had proclaimed himself a surrealist devoid of all moral values. He'd been received by Pope Pius XII in 1949, and as a result, the Italian state saw its way clear, clear to commission this set of prints. Gary Sheed is a personal choice of mine. I find his ongoing series on the Commedia deeply moving. The image on the cover of this small catalogue from 2014 shows Karen with Dante and Virgil heading towards the gates of hell, which are represented by the gates of Luna Park. Sheed had been working with Martin Sharp at Luna Park on the day before the ghost train fire in 1979. The next two cases contain objects on a completely different scale. In the first we have miniature editions printed for the high end of the book market and for the low end of the book market. They began as exquisite curiosities with marbling and, and beautiful matching leather bindings. Curiosities from Georgian England at the height of bibliomania and they continue to be produced today. We also have very cheap paperback editions as well. In the next 
case, we have two medals that come from the university's Chowchak Wing Museum collection. The medals by Eileen Slark and Michael Mazzaros are very much inspired by the enthusiasm of Sydney sculptress Eileen Slark. I love the glint on the polished bronze of this one as I walk past the case then the detail of the scene when I examine it more closely. The next windows on either side of the corridor here celebrate the work of Australian Dante collectors and translators and scholars. W. Stuart Mackay, who gave a vast collection of Dante editions to the library, the only Australian imprint of the Divine Comedy. I think it was probably printed in Britain, but given an Australian imprint there. And we're now in the final section of the exhibition uh, where we're looking at science fiction, cinema, popular fiction, short stories, novels. Would you like to say a little bit more about some of these? On this side we have more recent works by Australian Dante scholars, including the very rightly celebrated translation by Clive James and his wife Prue Shaw were both students at the University of Sydney in the 50s. We then move on to Dante in fiction, a rich vein of inspiration. Works here by Samuel Beckett, a thriller called The Dante Club by Matthew Pearl that's had a certain amount of success, and Dan Brown's Inferno, which gave employment to Dante scholars throughout the world, explaining to the rest of the world who Dante really was. Uh, as with The Da Vinci Code, uh, Dan Brown's grasp on cultural realities is different from our own. We have Dante in film. Uh, Dante's Inferno was the title of the first full-length movie in Italian, made in 1911. We're still working on a date for a screening of L'Inferno. It made extensive use of Gustave Doré's iconography, narrative perspectives and mise-en-scene and it set the tone for other movies that followed. And if we move over now to the, the last sections, we're going past our three wonderful examples from our extraordinary science fiction collection on to Dante and comedy rather than Dante's comedy. Mm -hmm. I put out a call for Dante Kitsch, but nobody I knew would admit to owning any. Nevertheless, three items mysteriously surfaced. We have Dante's uh, most famous sonnet, Lud, by heart, by every Italian schoolchild, in my generation at least, here being marketed as a contraceptive in a contraceptive packet. Uh, on the right, we have a cartoon by Sydney cartoonist Patrick Cook that was sent to his former teacher, John O. Ward, as a thank you note for dinner. John would turn up to the first lecture every year dressed as Pope Boniface VIII. I told you he would come up again and again. Full papal vestments and tiara. And here Boniface is damned in a farinaceous hell populated with popes and being stabbed with, <laughs> with pitchforks by three Dantes. And then in the middle we have a work by Sydney artist and longtime librarian in this library, uh, Richard Black. He reworks a hand-coloured print of the lithograph about 1920, of Henry Holliday's famed Dante and Beatrice that we skipped past in case 15. 
He's reworked it to leave the poet gazing at a large purple cabbage. So we're back to where we began at the other pole. Immeasurably enriched by our reading of Dante and the Commedia and thank you for your interest. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Julie.